Good morning, everyone. This is Dan Bacon with the Never Go Against the Family podcast here at the uh, UNI Family Business Center. This morning, I am uh, just pleased, really, to have Martha Sullivan with us. She is a consultant with the Family Business Consulting Group based out of Chicago. I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with that group. They are, in my opinion, one of the best, if not the best, at, at providing services in that realm to families. Um, and have been doing it a long time, kind of pioneers in that field, really. And um, Martha, excited to have you with us this morning, talking about, I would say, that tug of war between near-term happiness of uh, what can the business do for me today, and that long-term, how do we grow and reinvest in our business uh, from a family standpoint, Um and I know that you've got a lot of different ways that you bring uh, credibility and expertise to this. You've got a background in, I won't, I won't say the T word, but you've got a background in consulting within the financial space, right? And yes. you are a CPA, so I, I, I will let that out of the bag. Um, but most of your career has been spent in consulting uh, in different uh, ways with families. Um, and so maybe if you could just first give us a little background on, on yourself and, and then we can kind of get into this whole topic of, of this tug of war. You bet. You bet, Dan. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be, to be here and, and to talk with you again. So yes, I, uh, Martha Sullivan with the Family Business Consulting Group. Um, I, my uh, background is really a kind of a, an interesting winding road uh, in terms of um, I've spent, as I said, most of my career in consulting, but I've also spent a fair amount of my career working in family businesses as a controller, as um, a CFO. Um, the CFO was actually a turnaround of a family business that mm. I was involved in and that's where my um, CPA chops came in pretty handy <laughs> um, there but um, so I, I really in, enjoyed the experience of being involved in family business as a non-family member executive yeah. um, if you will and seeing um, I would say the good bad and the ugly with with family businesses and some of the challenges and joys and celebrations that that they share together. Um, so now um, I've been very focused over the last seven years on the the um, transition part of family business when when a family is looking towards how do we make the business better? How do we grow it? How do we get it ready for? ownership transition, leadership transition, and how do we learn how to um, come together and be aligned around some of the critical decisions that we need to make, whether it's on, uh, maybe it's a, a keeper keep or sell decision, maybe yeah. it's a, a dividends decision, maybe it's about which member of the, the next generation um, should take this key role or that key role, but really helping build alignment um, within families so they can make better decisions together. Cool. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the D word there, dividends. Um, I was doing some reading on on something here a few weeks ago that you wrote about about this tug of war, you know, and you mm -hmm. you're using this uh, acronym which I wasn't familiar with and. I guess you didn't invent it, but um, growth, risk, growth versus risk, profitability versus liquidity, however you want to look yep. at it. This yep. GRPL. Could you give us just a quick 30 second on GRPL or however you pronounce it? Yeah, and... we, we pronounce it as GRPL. Okay. Yes, right. it's, a, it's, it's, yeah, it's a very sophisticated term there. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, no, the Gripple model, I think, um, really does represent the tug of war that goes into managing a business um, and uh, having that balancing act between what's healthy for the business, what's healthy for the owners, and what's healthy for the family, mm -hmm. assuming that it is family owned. And 
um, you, if you focus on growth, you, it may be at the expense of profitability. If you are taking um, high risk on, you know, taking on more risk, you may be um, having to have more leverage or more debt in the business. And what does that do for your ability to pay dividends or to reinvest in the business? Yeah. Um, you know, if the bank comes along and, and puts on their golden handcuffs, which are golden for them, but not necessarily for the family, it could restrict your ability to pay dividends. Um, so there is this tug of war between, between growth, risk, profitability, and liquidity that every business needs to um, be mindful of and understand the varying dynamics. And in particular, within a family business, and the family even needs to understand that um, to manage expectations. Right. So they need to understand their own uh, kind of viewpoint of where they would be on that continuum of that tug of war. And then yes. be able to understand, or at least know, maybe not understand, but at least know where their other family members are coming from and why they might not be in the same spots on there. So if we just, you know, if we just take a growth, I don't know if you call if you would consider it growth versus risk, or if you would just think of it as gr risk, growth and risk seem to go together within this model, but it, you know, how, how would you ask the question to somebody to help them think about where they are? Like if they were going to actually go through some sort of an exercise to think about where am I and, and how do I get some self-awareness about where I am on this ripple model versus where other family members are? Well, sometimes we start as, as, as um, simple as having family members do an exercise of basically saying, okay, we just found, I'll just throw out a round number. I just found a random thousand dollars on the ground here. It's yours. Okay. What would you do with it? What would you do with it, Dan? What okay. would, what would Martha do with it? Mm -hmm. Martha might put it in the bank because Martha is more conservative. Dan might run out and, you know, like the kid in the candy store, run down to the candy store and yeah. buy all the candy that he likes. Another person might um, see a growth opportunity and want to go buy a company because, oh, that would be really cool. Let's see yep. what we can make out of that. And so it, it just having a, a really simplistic exercise that gets individuals to think about what is my relationship with money? What is yeah. my tolerance for, for risk? Um, and, and recognizing that that's going to evolve over time. My appetite for risk when I was 25 years old is very different from the, my appetite for risk when, when I was 45 years old or when I'll be 65 years old. Well, that's a long time from now, of course, but yes. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, 29 yeah. forever, okay. Of course, of course. So it, it, it is, I think it is very personal um, okay. and it needs to start with personal reflection. And so, you know, quite often I see this, like some of our family member clients and, and others that I interact with, you know, it's it bubbles up to the surface when it becomes active in uh, engaged working in the business owners versus their passive family peers and uh, the dividend checks aren't coming as consistently or they're not growing like they think they should be on one side. And the other side of the coin is you're starving the business of cash flow and growth and stability, et cetera. Right. And, and so that, yeah. I mean, that's a very real um, conundrum, especially as you move past first gen to second or third gen where, you know, especially on the passive side, the ties to the business, it's more of an investment a little bit more so than it is yeah. a, 
um, this, you know, family, blood, business, emotional tie thing, right? And so could you give us a little bit quick too on your thoughts on when should a family be starting to look at doing this? You know, I think part of the answer is before it becomes a problem, but when should a family be looking at going through an exercise like this? And how could it feed to a dividend policy? Uh, I got a few questions within here, so we might have to repeat them, but when has a dividend policy become something you advise your clients on and, and, right. and, and, and that kind of thing? So could you talk through that a little bit? So um, in terms of when to get started with yeah. the, the alignment and, and the, the Grippo work, um, it really, I like to think of uh, the, the utilization of the Grippo model almost in kind of a uh, begin with the end in mind type of a philosophy. It's okay. never too early to start having the conversations about what is our philosophy around growth? What is our philosophy around risk? What are our needs for profitability for liquidity and or reinvestment. Mm -hmm. um, doing that when you're in good times or even times um, is a heck of a lot better than when it's in um, times when the business is stressed. Sure. Because then it's going to be more inflamed. But, you know, if you can work through your, your Gripple policies and set your metrics that to me is really just good, solid business strategy. Um, you know, what is our growth target? What is our profitability target? How are we progressing on that? Are we hitting it? Are we off? Okay, we're off. Why are we off? Is it concerning or is it because we had a, a course correction that was intentional? Sure. Um, so Gripple in many ways is it bec can become a dashboard for the business, for the shareholder group, and for the family. So that um, there's, there's a, a level of transparency and shared understanding around what it is we're about as a family, how that ties to our values yep. and our, our vision as a family. And then, you know, translating that into what it means for the shareholder group what does it mean for the business itself yeah so some so, of it is taking your values and vision and applying it to the monetary side or the the business yes. side of how you're going to run the business right so you, yes. you mentioned something about metrics martha um what do you see as common metrics that people are you know so once we get an understanding of where our tolerances are or where our alignment and misalignment is as a family on this gripple model what um, yeah. <clears throat> what kind of metrics do we use as a family to to measure because obviously you have an, uh you know cfo background so we're going to want to be measuring things so what of what course. kinds of what kinds of things should we be measuring well i think there are some fairly um common and traditional metrics around growth around profitability um, in terms of what, what's the proper rate of growth. Um, if you've got a multifaceted business, business being um, aware of the fact that a growth rate for one division may not be appropriate for the growth rate of another division. But okay. it's it's basically, you know, looking at your business because, you know, what's the right metric for one industry may be a different metric in another. Yeah. But but your growth rate, your your net income, um percentage of revenue, your earnings before interest, um taxes, depreciation and amortization, EBITDA. Yep. Yeah, is a, is another very important metric as a percent of of revenue. Some fam for some families, they look at return on assets or return on equity um, to help them understand their their profitability. When it comes to risk, I think the most direct um, measure tends to come in to the concept of debt. Sure. Um, and so a debt to equity, or perhaps it could be even something more operational like 
um, your, your current ratio, your current mm -hmm. assets um, compared to your current liabilities. Yeah, I remember some of that. Yeah, yeah, ratios. This is yeah, yeah. Bean counting 101 here. Um, yeah, indeed. So the, but I also, um, because of my background in valuation and um, uh, exit planning, I also look at risk from qualitative factors as well. Okay. Um, in what terms of, it's like? not, well, understanding what are the threats to the business? Okay. So, so these aren't necessarily metrics, so we're, so we're kind of going down a, a, a rabbit path here. Um, but what's the dependency on um, okay. an industry owners? or a client or a employee? Uh, yeah, on a client or on let's say um, the patriarch. Yeah. If if or you know the key owners owner operators of the business is if there's a high dependency on them for the tribal knowledge, for making decisions, for key customer, key supplier relationships, that's a risk. That's a threat to the company. Yeah. If if the systems are shaky, that's a threat to the company's viability. And that could be a goose that, you know, that something that kills the golden goose. So risk can come in different forms in a family. Um, when you look at the metrics on the liquidity side, it may be what per, coming to a conclusion as to what is our target um, uh, percent of income we will pay out as dividends, or okay. what is our target yield on on the value of, of the company. Every, every company is is different in terms of what feels right to them. Yep, and um, the other point that I think it really needs to be emphasized here is education and what is the, the family's um, awareness, understanding, comfort with some of these financial um, tools and metrics and things of that nature. We know that financial understanding, financial knowledge, acumen, whatever word you want to apply to it, varies greatly within families. <laughs> yep. And, if, and their spouses, yeah. And their spouses, well, they're part of the family too, Dan. Of course they are, of course they are. I didn't mean that, yes, I'm sure um, they do. But, but I think if you're gonna embark on this effort, of, of designing these metrics and, and bridging that, that gap that may exist between the beneficial owners, those that are not working day-to-day -day in the business, but receive right. um, the benefit of ownership, like a spouse or like a sibling that's not involved in the day-to-day -day operation. Yeah. You've got to set a baseline of, of education and understanding as to the financial, how the how the money, how the company makes money. Yep. People okay. need to understand a, a baseline level of um, financial acumen. And very often that's where we start is with some education. Okay. So, so there's, you know, so if we, if we kind of summarize some of the steps, you know, we, we, uh, the family is having conflict over investing in a large piece of equipment or, um, uh, divesting a piece of the business or buying out a sibling or whatever it is that, that's triggering a, a monetary event. Typically, yeah. I would guess that, you know, is sort of where a lot of the families, you know, then, then start to break down in this gripple area and then they, they come fighting. Yes, they come. Yeah. They come looking for you, you know, uh, initial part of this process for you is educating, re-educating and getting everyone on the same page about how does our business make money? When does our business make money? You know, all those kinds of things, right? Um, so that we're not under false assumptions as a family in different ways or whatever it might be. Um, and then an, an understanding of where do we all fall in these growth yes risk, uh, profitability, and liquidity. Uh, liquidity needs, um, 
for ourselves, for the business, and then having conversation as a family about where we fall. So right. we're not just understanding ourselves, but we're understanding our our sibling and our mother-in-law and our cousin Eddie and all these other folks in, a, in that could potentially be owners, right? And then from that, it seems natural to me that the D word, the big D dividend is going to come in there to play at some point um, of, you know, because that's where I see it with families that I work with is, well, we're fighting about dividends. We don't have a dividend policy. And what are we, part of our family wants to do this, part of our family wants to do that, whatever it might look yep. like, right? Yep. How does that dividend policy start to get crafted from that initial process of discovery and education and self-awareness? Um, so, so part of that um, comes back to the, the family's values. Yep. So I, you know, that really is, is an underpinning to all this is what does the family value and let's work on alignment and, and consensus on that because that can become the backboard that the ball bounces off of before okay. it goes in into the net. So let's, let's give an example of um, dividend policies where some family members want to maximize it and you have other family members that never want to pay it. Sure. So the family members that never want to pay it are the ones that are, are wanting to make sure that the company always has their rainy day fund right. and we can always reinvest in the business and the, 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 the golden goose will, will always be as protected as possible and yep. protected. And then you've got the other side of the family saying, I want some eggs here. You know, if we've got this golden goose, I, yeah. I, I want, I need to make an omelet or two here. I need yeah. to see something for it. And I want, right. I want as much of it as I can. Well, the values exercise helps you say, well, what's really important to us? Where is that balance mm -hmm. that we're trying to achieve? And then with that in mind, you can start narrowing it down to what makes sense for the target metric. Okay, we know that we don't want to starve the business, but we also recognize and want to honor the fact that as owners, we are taking a risk. Okay. And as with any investment. Yep. If, if you're making an investment in a stock, if you're buying Apple stock, you are taking a risk. Well, the same is true when you're an investor in a family business, sure. whether you realize it or not, <laughs> there is that risk reward relationship that I, my personal philosophy is owners deserve some return on their investment. That may be quantitative, that may be moolala, or there may be other perks that come with it. Well, that's but fair. It, it shouldn't be, you're just an owner, a legacy owner of the business, and you just carry That will stuff. only fly for so long, right? Right. And is that really uh, appropriate? If that's the case, why are you owning the stock? Right. Very quickly, that question will be asked by either their spouse or their financial advisor or Why, why are we whoever. holding this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... It really, it, we we try to understand the varying and competing issues yep. and then slowly evolve that to, well, what makes sense for this company, this family, um, and how does that trickle down to the individuals? Can you give us, as we wrap up here, maybe, and I'm just going to put you on the spot, but an example of what a dividend policy might look like? just from the numbers standpoint of it, as far as, you know, we're going to pay out X if we hit Y or I, how does it, how might it look? That, I mean, it, some of them are just that, that basic and, and simple, um, Dan, in terms of, you know, we're going to set these, these um, net income targets. Okay. And if we, we hit that, this net income target, we want to understand what the budget is for next year. What are the needs of the company? Mm -hmm. um, 
and for reinvestment or other opportunities. And we're going to pay out, um, let's say net income, less a uh, defined amount of reinvestment amount. Yep. And here's our residual. Okay. And we'll pay the dividends will be based on the residual. So that's how some people form their, their dividend policies. Okay. Another um, family might say, nope, every year we are paying out 5% of net income as dividends. I'm pulling 5% out of my year. But yeah. that's the number that family came up with. I've actually and, heard that number before. So, um, and, and that's what their dividend policy is. And hopefully they went through a process of looking at historical and they know their business and they're getting good guidance from sure you know the CFO and the executives to know that that's what makes sense um so it it really gets custom tailored to the family but those are some very high level examples sure no I appreciate it I think that sometimes that's where a family wants to go right away is they just want a number on a piece of paper and you know the, this is what it is and the the messy sure. process to get there is the part they don't want to do very often but it and i appreciate that i i want to get to the finish line just as much as anybody yeah um, but it, you know, there are a number of ways that you can have really dysfunctional dividend policies if you go directly to that. And um, you might think that you're solving the problem because now we know 5% is going to be, right. be out there, yeah. but nobody knows where five came from. Yeah. Why not six? Why not four? And what happens when I don't think that's enough or when the CFO and the president of the company are concerned that that's too much and those kinds of things right right exactly no this is very it's a very tricky thing isn't it there's a lot of you know and there's a lot of moving parts and then there's a lot of uh you know I'm guessing this needs to be revisited and re you know talked about on an ongoing basis as a family yes. right and yes if you get non-family leadership of the company in there you know they you know is that as those faces change and those people change that that adds complexity and change to this as well i mean it's a very complicated topic as as far as you know keeping the peace with with everybody and and protecting our golden goose as you mentioned um well, and that's why, you know, one of the things that we really um, prescribe is having a having and following a process for those types of conversations and considering having them be facilitated yep. conversations because they can get they can get yucky. Yeah. Sure, um, that's and, a good word. Yeah, very professional, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they can get yucky and having somebody that's gone through through it before or is um not as vested in the outcome um help kind of guide the conversation and call a time out when people need to just take a deep breath or yeah. bring a different um lens to it can be Oh yeah really helpful very helpful brings accountability it brings a level of professionalism and seriousness to the conversations yes. and absolutely yeah makes people actually do their homework of of doing the self-reflection on where they are in this gripple model so if we kind of wrap up here martha is there any you know piece of advice you would give to families who are in this stage of you know, kind of that battle between um, long-term growth and, and near-term payouts and things like that, um, that, that you would want to make sure families keep in mind as they go through that? Um, two, <laughs> two thoughts come to mind. Mm -hmm. One is um, give yourself grace in going through the process um, recognize it may not be an easy process, but give yourself grace and go through a process. And then the other piece is to um, 
err on the side of inclusivity. Okay. And inviting family members, a broader group of family members to the conversation, then keeping it an itty bitty little, little posse that goes behind yeah. the the curtain and, and comes out with, with the policy. The more inclusive you are in building alignment, the more successful your ultimate outcomes will be. Um, the man, you know, the, the posse or the man behind the curtain um, is, is, is not very inclusive and it leaves a lot of room for people to make false assumptions sure. and that just, that erodes trust in the process and, and the um, ultimate policies and decisions that you make. So give yourself grace and err on the side of inclusivity. Okay. Hey, that's a great wrap. Thanks, Martha. Thank you of for course, joining us you. this morning. Really appreciate your advice and, and expertise in this space. And um, again, my guest has been Martha Sullivan with the Family Business Consulting Group. Thank you very much for listening to another edition of Never Go Against the Family here at the uh, UNI Family Business Center. Thanks for listening to this episode of Never Go Against the Family, a podcast produced by the University of Northern Iowa Family Business Center. You can find more information about the center, membership, and upcoming events at unifamilybusinesscenter.com. As Vito Corleone advises, never go against the family.